So welcome to breakout session number one. Just a reminder to please mute your microphones so we have the best audio quality and we can hear our speaker. <laughs> I'm pleased to introduce Ernst, who is from Hilltoppers. Hey, uh, I'm Ernst. So like Melody said, I'm from Hilltoppers. Uh, this is my 11th season in FRC, so I'd like to think I have a pretty good grasp on pneumatics, but the normal disclaimer uh, with any of these topics is that a lot of what I'll share will be the facts and rules, but a lot of it will also be opinions. So it may come up if you've uh, been in FRC a bit that you disagree with something I say, that's fine. Um, or you might have some questions. Uh, please, uh, for the purpose of this being kind of a different format on Zoom, uh, please put those questions or disagreements, hopefully not, uh, in the comments, and then we'll uh, have time at the end to circle back to them. Uh, my backup, I don't know if he's paying attention, is uh, Wes Bassendale, also from Team 1732. Uh, Wes might weigh in to offer some more examples, or he might answer questions in chat, or he might be totally silent. Uh, hard to say. So uh, we'll run through a couple different things. And what you gain from this presentation will be different depending on the level of involvement you've had with FRC or your experience or what you've done outside of it. Um, but I'm hoping that kind of across the board, whether you are brand new or uh, you've been here a few times before, um, that you learn generally how this stuff works, uh, what some FRC specific rules and options and best practices are, uh, a couple mechanism options that you can use. Uh, and then kind of just start thinking through how you can use pneumatics on a robot or when and where you can use it. A major point of order that we have to cover uh, is I, I'm going to mention PSI or pressure a lot. So really, I, that's force per area. So I'll say pounds per square inch PSI. Um, that's, that's our air pressure uh, simplified for this presentation. So Really what that just means is cramming more air into the volume that we're using. Um, but it'll be very helpful to think of it, uh, in this case, as a force pushing on an area in a lot of context. Uh, so why would you want to use any of this? I think before we go into how any of it works, uh, and we'll circle back and rehit all of these points, but um, pneumatic mechanisms can be really, really simple to design. Um, and the comparison to think about is what would it take to make a motor do the same function? So to take a motor and add a gearbox and add gears or chains or belts or something to the output, and you have that going over to a different rotating thing, that can have a lot of design work, that can have a lot of room that it takes up. So if you have a pneumatic system, uh, you can very easily cover a couple applications. You can very easily, uh, if you have an elbow or something, make it pivot up you can very easily make something slide and extend. So there are a couple uh, applications that we'll go through where it's, it's really advantageous to just, it, it's simple to just use pneumatics. Um, so if you haven't used it, please consider it. Uh, you can also adjust your force. So we'll go through how to do that. Um, and you can get a really, really strong force pretty easily. Uh, so with a motor, if you're thinking of uh, a ton of gear reductions to go from your uh, you know, 6,000 RPM motor down to an arm that slowly lifts 100 pounds or something, that can be a lot of complexity that can take a lot of work to make a motor do that job. With a pneumatic cylinder, you just get a really hefty one and you can really easily push a couple hundred pounds. Um, and then uh, the last point, easy to add later. I wouldn't recommend this, but it is a lot easier. Well, maybe I would recommend it. Um, don't plan on it, but it's easy. It's a good option. Uh, to be able to just kind of spot in a pneumatic cylinder and a pivoting thing or an unlocking thing after the fact. Um, and again, that's compared to adding a mechanism that uses motors. So uh, pneumatics in FRC, we'll go through what all these parts do, but um, this is the general overview. And you'll see a really similar, um, a, a really similar diagram in the FRC manual, which you should read. There is a section of the FRC manual that covers uh, pneumatic systems and what you're allowed to use, what you're required to use. So I'll mention a bunch of those rules. But really, before you put any of this stuff on a robot, you you need to read that uh, manual. There are a lot of really specific rules. Um, a lot of things were required to use. Uh, and yeah, if, if you do it wrong, you're going to have a bad time at your competition. 
So in general, the way this is split up, we have our air compressor that's compressing our air, right? And we have storage. And then that next set um, in the middle on the bottom, that's kind of our, our regulating or that's kind of our, our monitoring system. So the pressure switch uh, lets us know if we're getting up to the right pressure. And again, we'll go through all these. I just wanted to do a brief overview. Um, and then up on the, on the far right, that's what we're actually using. That's where we're turning our storage into uh, something useful for us. Um, but overall, from the rule standpoint, we're talking about 120 PSI on our storage side and 60 or fewer uh, pounds per square inch on the, the working side. Uh, so that'll be across the board. That is a rule, um, which you would know if you read the manual. But uh, that'll be, I, I might circle back to that, I might not. Uh, but that's a really important starting point to know. We're working with two different pressures and that is uh, legislated to us. So all these components, which again, we'll get into, uh, there are a lot of different things that the rules specify versus what we want to do. So the, the stuff in red, uh, which is just the pressure switch, you are required to use this specific one. So I'll explain how it works, but there aren't any cool options there. Um, it, the stuff in yellow, there, there are a couple options, but for the most part, there isn't really a reason to diverge too much. Uh, and then the stuff in green is where it really opens up and gets fun. And you can do as much as or as little as you want to vary and find cool custom stuff. Not custom, different stuff. Uh, the pneumatics across the board, I think one of the key rules is that you cannot customize, you cannot modify this. So you couldn't take your pneumatic cylinder and drill a hole in it and tap a new fitting in place or something. That would definitely be against the rules and make your inspectors very disappointed. So let's start all the way at the left there. Uh, we have our air compressor. Um, so the most common ones in FRC are uh, what's shown on the right. I don't know if the animation comes through well, but the, the reciprocating uh, single stage compressor there. Um, so there are a couple more concepts built into there. You can see the little, maybe you can see the little check valves uh, pulsing there. Uh, so you have one way flow through it. Um, so while the motor is cranking, what we're doing is turning our uh, rotation into air movement. Uh, and because of those one-way valves, we're able to use that um, to, to start to pressurize our system. So what does that mean specifically in FRC? Uh, here are some examples. Uh, the one on the top left um, is from Andy Mark. You won't see it as much anymore. Uh, the, the bottom one is the Viair 90C, which is probably the most common compressor in FRC. Uh, and there's a good reason for that. Uh, it's very small and lightweight. Um, you can not easily, but you know, pretty, pretty much without a hassle, tuck it somewhere on the robot. Um, it gets hot though, so I would definitely put a fan on it, uh, it which is super easy. You should get a fan in the kit of parts. Um, the, the one on the top, I'll come back to it. So the 1.1 pump, uh, you're allowed 1.1 uh, cubic feet per minute of flow out of a compressor. So this one was kind of designed as that high flow option. It's not a great option to use this one though. Uh, so this compressor has a bad design problem. It's actually not for sale anymore. Uh, so if you have used these or you're considering using the, them again, I would pump the brakes on that. Uh, it has a motor problem where you get wires shorting to the frame and then you blow a fuse on the, your power distribution panel and you have a bad time. Uh, there are other ones similar to the Viair compressor uh, that are available with a higher flow or a lower weight. Um, you get pretty marginal gains from that uh, and they're more expensive. Uh, so generally I would just stick with that one. It's the simplest, um, but there are a couple options if you wanna uh, dig through the weeds a little. Uh, this may be another point of order that we need to cover but not go too deep on. Uh, <laughs> the idea of pipe thread and threaded fittings. If you're new to the world of pneumatics, these sizes don't make any sense. Um, you see like a one inch NPT, what the heck? This isn't a one inch diameter fitting. Um, it's goofy. Just get, you know, get a chart, look at it, uh, really, really double check stuff before you buy it. Um, when you're working with an FRC, uh, you'll see a lot of quarter inch NPT fittings. And I think that might quarter inch and eighth inch might be what come in the kit of parts. Uh, you'll also get a lot of cylinders that use the 1032 size, which that isn't a taper, but um, it's another common size. Uh, but generally, these are how you're gonna be putting your components together. So if I go back, uh, you can't really see it here. Uh, I'll go back even further, there we go. So like all the brass fittings that are on this slide, those all actually have that pipe taper on them. 
and you can see a little bit of white tape poking out there. Um, that's the that's the thread sealer. So because these uh, threads are tapered and coming together, uh, this would be good to have a whiteboard and share the share that. But whatever. Um, when those threads are coming together uh, with the taper, you kind of crank it and drive them and force them. To, it, it would make more sense with a whiteboard, but you, you sort of force those. It, it's like ramming a uh, triangular plug into a triangular opening kind of, but you know, more of a trapezoid. Um, and then you need the, the thread sealer to prevent anything from actually going through there. So when you're tightening these together, uh, you'll see some people who get super into it and then end up breaking it because they go too far. Um, but the, the key is to get it pretty tight and also have a really good seal with your uh, thread sealer. So going back forward, um, the thread sealer, uh, Teflon tape is really common. Uh, uh, something like Loctite 545 is also a really good option though. Um, I cannot tell you how many times people have goofed up the Teflon tape. You have to wrap it the right way. You have to put the right amount of it on. It's very easy to mess it up. I think every single time that I'm starting to uh, wrap a fitting, I'll do it the wrong way, put it, uh, ugh, and then I have to redo it. So um, the Loctite 545 is a lot more foolproof, but um, whichever one you do, uh, it's important to practice it. Uh, I think another quick point on these, uh, small brass fittings can be easy to break. So like the big ones, if you're putting together, I don't know, half inch NPT brass uh, as a huge block for a bunch of your components that you, know, you can crank the heck out of that probably. If you're doing 1032 brass, there's a good chance you'll break it. Uh, if you're not careful. So um, again, a lot of this stuff, it, it just takes some practice. You have to be careful with it. But yeah, th this is what holds a lot of our systems together. So FRC fittings, um, what will you see a lot of uh, is quarter inch, uh, quarter inch tubing. So the quickest way to switch over from, from your brass, from your compressor to that quarter inch tubing is with something like on the top right. Uh, you'll see a lot of those ones. Um, and then when you're breaking out tubes, other tubes, you end up with your, your rat's nest of sp your spaghetti. Uh, you'll see a lot of dividers and splitters. Um, generally though, I think it's, it's really good to standardize on sizes. So you'll see a lot of quarter inch tubing. That's the legal max size that we're allowed in FRC. Um, so of course you'll see a lot of it, uh, but then for picking your thread size, like I mentioned earlier, quarter inch NPT and uh, 1032 threads are probably the most common. So stock up on those. Uh, where the threads get weird is when you're actually buying pneumatic cylinders, which we'll talk through those in a little bit, but um, it's really important to check what those take. If you're ordering something on, you know, McMaster or Bimba or wherever, uh, it, it might be a weird size, it might be a metric size, hopefully not. Ugh. But uh, de definitely check that you have the right fittings stocked. And sometimes we purposely buy uh, a specific pneumatic cylinder because it matches our uh, standard fitting sizes. So that's a, a key to pay attention to. Air tanks. So this is an area where uh, you have some freedom, but <laughs> probably don't use it. So the, these Clippard air tanks, you can get them from Andy Mark. Uh, you can get them from Clippard. I think you get a kit of parts voucher to get some of these. These are the easiest way to go. Um, you're allowed, you could put a scuba tank on your robot if you want, but then when you're at the competition, you're gonna have a really bad time proving to your inspector that it matches all of the right rules, that, it, uh, that it's legal, that it's rated properly. The easiest thing to do is just to use these clippered ones uh, and then make your life a breeze. Um, they're pretty good. I think they're about a three quarter liter capacity. So you will see teams with a bank of like six of these in a row or something. Um, but you know, they're, they're the most common, they're the most ubiquitous for a reason. They're, they're easy to use, they're very clearly legal um, and everyone has spares of them. So that's another, another key of using kind of that, that standardized part. Um, these ones do get kind of goofy uh, with leaks sometimes. So it's not shown in this picture, but on the on each end of it, it has a little press-in fitting, very similar to these ones. So uh, the way those fittings work, you stick a tube into it and then kind of pull a little to set it. Uh, there's a very similar fitting on the on each end of the clipper air tank. So 
those fittings can break um, eventually, especially if someone doesn't know what they're doing. Uh, and very, very rarely they can leak. So it's definitely worth uh, considering that when you're troubleshooting a system, when you're inevitably troubleshooting leaks in your pneumatics. Um, but yeah, overall, just use the clippered ones unless you have a really, really good reason not to. So tubing, like I mentioned earlier. Um, so the, the standard max size that you're allowed to use is quarter inch tubing. Um, you can get this on AndyMark directly. AndyMark is the most common supplier, I'd say, uh, for just overall FRC parts. You can get it all over the place, though. Um, like Automation Direct, we order a lot of our parts through. Uh, McMaster has it for probably a more expensive price. Um, but uh, the quarter inch tubing is, yeah, it's by far the most common. Um, and just use this pretty much across the board unless you have a good reason not to. Um, especially on the high pressure side, I'm not going to go back through 10 slides. On the high pressure slide, uh, sorry, side, uh, between your compressor and your air tank uh, and all of that um, required type stuff on the 120 PSI side of your system, use the quarter inch tubing. Uh, you have no reason not to. Um, it, it'll help you with getting faster, with more flow over to your other side. So the other side, the working side, uh, and you can see some of this pictured on the right, uh, you can use smaller tubing. It's so like that picture on the right shows quarter inch tubing going down to 532nd inch tubing. Um, that has a lot of benefits. Uh, for the most part, that's enough flow for almost all FRC applications. So like you can see that picture on the left, uh, it's not a very good picture to show the example, but that's uh, the 532nd inch tubing going into a small pneumatic cylinder uh, for an intake mechanism to pivot it up. And it's it's enough flow, it's fine. It's about a third of the cross-sectional area of the quarter inch tubing. So you get a third of the flow at the same pressure, roughly. Um, this stuff has a lot of benefits and you know, for, for routing it around the robot, it has a much smaller bend radius. It's much smaller, it's less of a hassle to deal with. Um, when we switched over to mostly 532nd inch tubing, uh, the students who had to actually put the robot together were very, very excited and thankful for it. Uh, it just made life so much easier. So if you don't use it, consider it. Uh, I, this one has less of a standard. Uh, quarter inch is you know, clearly the rule, clearly the standard. For smaller sizes, 532nd inch is less ubiquitous, but I'm trying to push it because I think it's awesome. Uh, there will be areas where maybe you need a very, very fast action. So maybe you do still run quarter inch for some things, uh, but for a lot of stuff, going smaller is nice. Uh, there's also a benefit for everything being quarter inch. I guess I'll do devil's advocate and argue with myself here. Um, for everything being quarter inch, then you're only stocking one set of fittings, one set of tubing, uh, and you're not as, you don't need to think about uh, which applications might use one or the other. Um, but, you know, if you want to create a chore for yourself that might have benefits, then I'd consider uh, using both. So uh, going into another one of the uh, components that we're required to use, this is the pressure switch. Uh, the way that it works uh, is kind of shown there. You have air pressure coming in and fighting against a spring to uh, complete a circuit. Uh, what does this mean in FRC? So our compressor is churning, it's filling up our air tanks. And then this pressure switch that we have, when we hit 120 PSI, which is our limit, our legal limit that we're allowed to have on the storage side, the pressure switch closes and that'll send a signal, uh, which gets processed to shut off the compressor. So uh, like I mentioned earlier, this is one that we're required to use. Everyone has the same one. Uh, there's a little bit of a range though. So if you're really trying to be a perfectionist, um, you could test a bunch of these and see which one gets to the highest pressure if you want that. Um, sounds like a lot of work and it's not a lot of benefit, uh, but it is an option uh, if you need extra chores to do. Uh, a check valve. So this is one you might never use on its own on your robot, but it's a really important concept that plays into a lot of the other things that we'll get through uh, moving forward. So a check valve, uh, the diagram on the left shows, it's a spring-loaded ball and it only allows flow to go in one direction. That's the key. It's a one-way uh, valve. So uh, the compressor, for example, it had those two different check valves on it, right? 
where air is only allowed to go in one direction and that's how it builds pressure. But these are also built into a lot of other mechanisms. Um, there are some cool options to do uh, some check valve protected systems on your robot uh, as, a, as a safety mechanism essentially uh, to prevent depressurization, which maybe we'll get into at the end if we have time. But there are some cool uses for standalone ones. So like that one on the right from Automation Direct, if you wanted a standalone one, you can get it. But again, almost all teams, most if not all teams will not use standalone uh, check valves on the robot. But we'll have a ton of them built into other stuff. So here's one of those examples. Um, a pressure relief valve is another part of the robot that's required. Um, and I'll show a couple examples from uh, FRC use. But the, the device overall, the way it works, you're using a thread to adjust a spring force to change how much that check valve is loaded. So the purpose of the pressure relief valve <clears throat> is to keep you below the maximum operating pressure, so 120 PSI. Your pressure relief valve, you would set the threading to set it to 120 to 125 PSI, so that if for some reason your pressure switch is not working correctly, uh, if your pressure switch does not send that signal to turn off the compressor, you have this built-in mechanical backup now where your pressure relief valve uh, when you exceed 125 PSI, when you overcome that spring force in it, it will just automatically vent. So what does that look like for FRC? Um, we have these two different options, really. Um, this, isn't a, this isn't a hard coded law that you have to use one of these. You can find other stuff if you'd like to, but these are by far the most common ones. And I think these are the part numbers listed in the FRC manual. Uh, so the one on the left, um, that's the, the Norgren one, that's an adjustable valve. So like I showed on the previous slide, that one has threading built in and you twist that top to set your spring force to change the pressure at which it vents. Um, this one is, yeah, like I said, you manually set this to the right pressure. Uh, so during the inspection process to make sure your robot is competition legal, you'll see a lot of teams with wrenches buried in their robot working on this thing to make sure it's set to the right trip point. Uh, the other one, so this is, I included the McMaster part number for it. This one is automatically set uh, to 125 PSI. So you don't have to manually mess with it. Uh, you don't have to sit underneath the robot with some wrenches trying to get it to the right setting. Uh, if it's working correctly, it should automatically go at 125 PSI. Um, I've had some weird results with those automatic ones where uh, sometimes they vent open and then stay open way longer than they should. So instead of getting to 125 and keeping or and then venting back to you know 115 or 120, they just stay open and dump out tons and tons of air. So these ones can be a little goofy. Um, <clears throat> some teams absolutely swear by them. I personally don't really, I, I don't know, I've been scarred by them a few times where we had one come open during a match and vent everything. Uh, they also have, you can see that little pull ring on top of it. So if you want to vent that way, you can just yank on that ring uh, to bleed off pressure. But I think that's what hurt us during a match where we had that get caught on something and get pulled open and dump all of our pressure. Then all of our pneumatic system didn't work. So I don't know, I don't like them. Some teams absolutely swear by them. And maybe if you have it protected, tucked in a really safe spot on the robot, uh, that would be a very, very good option. And yeah, less, less maintenance. You don't have the chore of setting your uh, relief valve to the right pressure then. So another part of the required system that we have is the pressure regulator. Um, don't look too much at this diagram if you don't want to, it's kind of goofy, but essentially what's going on here, this is very similar to the pressure relief valve um, where you can use a thread to adjust a spring force to adjust how much air can go through. The difference with the pressure relief valve so the pressure relief valve just exhausts that extra air. Um, the pressure regulator is what sends that from our 120 PSI uh, storage side over to our working side. So it doesn't dump it to the environment. This is what we use to get our 120 PSI down to our 60 to actually use it for mechanisms. Um, the difference between this uh, and the relief valve though, it isn't just the thread that's setting that force. You also have a diaphragm. So by the air pressure pushing on the diaphragm and by the adjustment handle 
uh, setting the thread, the spring is getting two different adjustments. Uh, and that is what sets, uh, in this case, it's shown as the poppet there, essentially a check valve again, right? Um, you're adjusting how much air can go through. And uh, by having both of those, we're able to set it to, for example, 60 PSI to get that fixed pressure that comes out. Don't, don't overthink some of these, how, how some of these work necessarily. It's, it's cool to know, but yeah, what's important for this one to understand is that we're able to take our whatever input pressure and set it to a fixed output pressure. So what does that look like in FRC? Um, that picture on the top left, that is probably the most common one. I think that's what comes in the kit of parts. It's kind of bulky though. Um, there's nothing wrong with it. It works perfectly well. It has uh, an input, it has multiple outputs. Uh, it's, a, it's a good functional regulator. There are smaller options too though. Um, so one option that's really nice, uh, you can get these mini pneumatic uh, devices from Automation Direct or from Andy Mark. Um, they, so like you can see on the bottom right there, uh, there are two gauges, one to show the high pressure 120 PSI side, then the little regulator tucked into the middle uh, and then another uh, another gauge downstream to show the working side pressure. So it should be 60 or lower PSI, right? Um, but the, the mini devices are just nice. You can tuck them in smaller places. You can actually do a panel mount if you want. It's kind of kind of cool where you have like a, a well-machined sheet with just your gauge sticking out, but that's totally not required. Like you can see on that picture on the bottom right, it's just sort of you know loose on the robot somewhere. But it, it's very convenient, especially if you have a team that doesn't like to design in place for the, the pneumatic components <laughs> uh, or likes to ignore that and uh, we'll figure it out later. Um, these, are, these are really helpful then. So uh, at this point in our system, we've gone through our compressor, we've got our storage, uh, we've got our regulator and we're at the working side now. So we're at our 60 PSI and then what? Uh, well, then we use solenoid valves to direct air to different things. So a solenoid valve is a, a switch, essentially. Um, if we have our two different outputs, this is how we select which one is getting air. Uh, this is how we select which way the pneumatic cylinder is going. Um, how does it actually work? This is another thing where we're converting our uh, electrical signals into a mechanical action. So the compressor is the first one, right? We're turning our electrical rotation into the pumping uh, uh, cylinder or into the pumping piston there. Uh, this is one where by energizing a coil, we move a magnet to open or close a valve. Um, that's kind of weird to think about on its own. So let's look at how we actually interact with those in the FRC environment. Uh, here's These ones are from SMC. They're pretty common. They're sold by or they're sold on VEX Pro among other places. But uh, what does a pneumatic cylinder or a, a pneumatic solenoid valve actually look like? Um, on that picture on the right, you can see a row of four of them attached to on the bottom, it's called a manifold. So up on the top, those four different solenoids, solenoid valves, um, those have the whole uh, little coil and moving magnet and valve built into them. So it's, it's a pretty small uh, mechanism. There are other ones, there are a ton of other ones. Uh, you'll get different standalone ones. So these ones are all bundled together into one package. Uh, you can get standalone ones too. I think the manifold ones are very, very convenient and nice to use uh, for a couple different reasons. One is that they reduce points of failure um, by, by sharing a lot of the hardware. So the way that the manifold on the bottom works, you have an input coming to it uh, where your airline comes in and then these valves switch what's going on through those outputs. So you can see there's row A and B of the outputs. Um, and by switching your solenoid valve, you're switching from A to B, for example. Um, but by having it all built into one block, you're reducing the number of fittings that you're using. So reducing the, the places that your Teflon tape could get messed up. You're reducing the number of places where a hose can pop out uh, and reducing your points of failure. One key though, uh, with these manifolds, if you're not using everything, you can sort of see it in that picture on the left. Uh, you can cap the extra ports, um, both the solenoid valve ports on the top, you can cap the extras, and then the um, extra uh, outlets, the extra uh, ports on the side, A and B, you can plug those as well. 
So if you don't, you're going to leak all your air and have a bad time. Ah, uh, so pneumatic cylinders. I've mentioned these a lot. We're finally there. We're finally from the compressor all the way to the end where we're actually moving stuff. Um, one note here, don't just call them a piston. A piston is part of the overall device that we have going on, right? Overall, this is called a pneumatic cylinder and it contains a piston. It contains the piston rod. It contains the, um, the piston uh, head itself, but it's overall, it's a pneumatic cylinder. Um, we could go into the calculation a little bit for how it works, um, but essentially going all the way back to the second slide, the key here is our pressure, the, the force times the area. So if we have a one inch bore cylinder, what is the surface area of that? Uh, well, luckily I pre-calculated it. Uh, that would be 0.79 square inches. So if we have 0.79 square inches, and we're running at 60 PSI, 60 pounds per square inch. Our force that we calculate now is 47.4 pounds. So finally, that first slide makes sense. Uh, we're, or sorry, second slide makes sense. Uh, we're using our air pressure to push this pneumatic cylinder to extend it. Um, you do get a little bit of loss for the pulling function. Uh, you can see that, or you can kind of see there, um, the piston on one side is just open and then on the other side has a rod. So you lose a little bit of force from that rod. You lose some of your surface area that you're pushing on. Um, but that should be neg negligible. Uh, if that makes your mechanism not work, then you are <laughs> right on the margins. Um, but it, it, it does matter sometimes. Uh, there are a couple different types of pneumatic cylinders. So the one shown on this slide, this is called a double acting. Uh, we have our two ports. So the way this would be hooked up, you have your two uh, hoses coming out of your solenoid valve. One goes to one port, the other goes to the other port. When you pressurize one of them, the cylinder extends. When you pressurize the other and vent that first one, the cylinder retracts. The other option would be a single acting cylinder. So these ones use a spring, uh, either to extend or to retract. So instead of having pressure instead of using your airflow to both push and pull, you're only using it for one and you're letting the spring do the other half of the work. Um, why would you ever do this? It saves some of your air pressure, which we'll talk about a little bit, but uh, this, this, saves you, uh, this saves your compressor from having to work as hard. This might mean you can have one fewer tank on the robot, um, but it, it saves you some of that, uh, some of that air usage. What do these look like in FRC? These are just industry standard parts, but um, you know you can get. It's not like there are the custom FRC pneumatic cylinders, um, and that's by the FRC rules too. You're not allowed to use custom ones. Uh, so just you can order them from wherever the heck you want. Um, I've mentioned Automation Direct a lot for other fittings and hoses. You can just buy your cylinders there too. One stop shop. Um, Bimba and McMaster are really good options. Some of it depends on where you're located. I think there's a Bimba distribution center near Chicago, so we can get pretty fast shipping and pretty good prices from them. Um, what are the different options? I mentioned the single acting ones and the double acting ones. You can get some really cool like mini pneumatic cylinders. It's just a thing where you poke around and see what the options are um, and what you need for your different applications. So another, another uh, new part for us, uh, this is the flow control valve. So you don't have to use these. This is an optional one. It's why it's kind of <laughs> later on in the presentation. But uh, the flow control valve, it doesn't change your pressure. It changes how much flow you have. So what that can do for you is slow down a pneumatic cylinder movement, which is really important sometimes. Um, if you're running uh, your intake, for example, if you want to open up the intake mechanism, and you just have that running at full pressure, poof, it's gonna slam open, poof, it's gonna slam closed. And every time it does that, you risk breaking stuff. Uh, so by slowing that down, you still have the same holding force. It's still getting to the same correct pressure, right? It just slows down and makes it a smoother process. So how slow do you want it to be? I mean, you don't want your intake to take five seconds to open up, but maybe instead of cutting it from bang, instantaneous and tearing itself apart, 
drop it down to half a second. So it's a more graceful and less violent function. Um, eventually, your mechanical team will thank you because even though they had to install an extra valve here, um, it means that a mechanism didn't tear itself apart. And yeah, how does it actually work? So uh, full control valves are usually a one-way situation where like you can see there's the threaded um, screw on there and it's kind of like kinking a hose where you're changing how much uh, flow can go through by tightening that screw. Uh, but in the other direction, it has a check valve. Check valves popping up again. Uh, so the hose is kinked in one direction essentially, but for going the other way, it can go at full flow. Um, so this means that, there we go. Um, how do you use them in FRC? Uh, one application that you'll see is these, uh, these ones directly on fittings. Um, and you can have that attached to both ends of your pneumatic cylinder. So this way you can slow down differently the extend and the retract. And because of that check valve, you don't have this weird math going around where you're trying to balance how both of them are working together. Uh, you're just setting one of them for the extend and one of them for the retract. Uh, another option, um, that middle picture, uh, middle left-ish picture, uh, you can do an inline uh, flow control. Um, it kind of it kind of just depends on your process. If you know ahead of time, okay, this pneumatic cylinder is going to definitely need a flow control, we'll build it in. If you don't find that until your robot's all the way put together, and you're testing and uh-oh, this is going to tear itself apart. Then you snip a tube, put one of these in. Um, to be totally honest, that's what happens more commonly on my team, <laughs> that we don't plan correctly. And then we end up using a ton of the inline ones. Um, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, defending myself right now. <laughs> they, they both work perfectly fine. Uh, but you can also use the, um, the inline ones in a slightly different way. Uh, if you have a standalone solenoid valve, um, you can use one of these for the input to it uh, instead of having two different ones on the outputs. So you could actually use these to reduce your part count. Um, but yeah, typically the way that I've used them is that we forgot to put flow controls on the cylinders and we're using it as a drop-in fix. Uh, so I've mentioned a couple times, like the pressure switch sends a signal back and then that turns off the compressor. Well, it doesn't, you know, it's not like the pressure switch is hooked up directly to the compressor. You've got something in between them, and that's the pneumatic control module. Uh, so this is kind of the brains of our operation. Um, well, not really. Uh, it's communicating back to the robot control system, and it's uh, our interaction for the pneumatics to the control system. So this runs the compressor. This is what sends a signal over to switch our solenoids. This is what what gets the signal in from our pressure switch. And yeah, it's... It's what the uh, RoboRio, the brains of the robot, is talking to to make sure all of that stuff is working correctly. Uh, there are a couple notes on this one. So uh, <laughs> the the wiring into those little white uh, connectors called the Weidmuller connectors, wires can get a little goofy there. So uh, I don't know how much the electrical presentation, uh, it's a different session, we'll go into this. But you can use, they're called ferrules. They're little crimp on metal tubes that go on wires so that are a little more reliable. Um, another thing you can sort of see on there, I don't know if my mouse shows up, but this little jumper here is super important. Um, so depending on the solenoid valves that you have, they'll be set to either 12 or 24 volts, and you have to use all of the same voltage across all of your solenoid valves. You can't have like 12 volts on this side and 24 volts on this side. You need them all to be 12 or 24, and then you need to set your jumper to match that. If for some reason you wanted to run some at 12 and some at 24, it's fine, but you need two different pneumatic control modules then. Uh, there's some benefits of running at 24 volts. Um, that'll be, for the most, all, all else being equal, that'll be a stronger uh, solenoid then. Um, and also, there's a built in uh, in the pneumatic control module for 12 volts. It's just unregulated coming in from the battery. The battery voltage will vary from 14 to 6 volts. Um, so there have been situations where that unregulated 12 volts will mess up your pneumatic functionality. That's rare, but it, it has happened. Um, but the 24 volts on here is regulated. So you'll get a much more reliable and consistent uh, uh, voltage for switching your solenoids. 
So something to consider. Uh, this is also, um, this is the old control system. Uh, there will be a new one slowly coming out over the course of this year and for the 2022 FRC season. So don't go out and buy 30 of these right now or something. Um, they will be getting uh, replaced pretty soon. But the new one should be similar but better. So, okay, we've gone through, uh, we've gone through a bunch of those different uh, control system parts. Let's look at some actual examples, uh, pneumatic mechanisms. So we've got one very, very easy implementation is linear motion. Uh, so you can see three different examples here where we're showing uh, linear motion. So on the top, this little carriage guy would extend out. Uh, this was for the 2019 game to grab those big uh, plastic discs. Uh, here way back in 2012, uh, this was a, a flywheel uh, shooter. This whole hood would extend up and down like two feet. Um, and then on the bottom right here, this is 2013, also from the archives. But uh, the end game was to climb up onto this pyramid jungle gym thing. So a bunch of teams implemented little pull-up bars or little pull-up uh, pneumatic cylinders. Uh, and these are all functions where if you think about what it would take to do that with a motor, it would be super annoying. You have to do maybe like a rack and pinion gear system where you're spinning to extend something. Um, it's It just gets really, especially like, how do you extend something two feet with a rack and pinion? That's just a mess. Um, so a lot of different options for linear motion. It's just super easy, especially if you only need two positions to implement that with uh, pneumatics. Keynote though, um, usually you shouldn't just have a pneumatic cylinder on its own. That's kind of okay for something like the pull-up function here, uh, where as long as you have it centered on your robot center of gravity correctly and you pull, your force is still staying in line. You're probably not gonna bend that cylinder. Uh, but for some of these other ones, um, there are a lot of linear guides built in. Like you can sort of see these yellow blocks and the black rail behind it. That's the, the guide for the system. That's taking a lot of the other forces. It's taking the twisting and the side loads. Uh, same thing, it's sort of tucked into the, the hood here, but there are these rails built in uh, to take a lot of that extra load. And I will get back to that point. Uh, so short rotations, going even deeper into the archives. So the, the 2011 uh, uh, giant claw to grab these inner tubes, uh, that's a short rotation to open and close to grab them. Uh, here in 2017, the, these red wheels and these weird V fins, this thing dropped down to pick up big plastic yellow gears. Um, and then uh, 2019, I think I showed a, a different picture of this earlier, uh, but this intake swung out um, to be able to pick up balls. So for the, these kind of short rotations, uh, it's really easy to just put something on an axle to be able to pivot and then run, run a pneumatic cylinder to it and poof, poof, slam it open and slam it closed. Um, the, the way that you mount that can get a little dicey, but I'll get back to that. Um, these, these are also all examples where you would probably want some flow control on them. You don't want your intake slamming way the heck hard down into the ground and destroying itself. Uh, another one, so this is kind of a weirder, harder one to describe, but constant force and it's maybe, whatever. Um, a, a couple other applications for pneumatics would be something like a gear shifter, where when you're switching uh, from your high speed to your low speed in a drivetrain gearbox, for example, um, Part of what's, depending on how the gearbox is designed, part of what can go on there is that you're, you're not designing to run at the exact limit. You're sort of having the cylinder never quite reach the limit. So it's always pushing to stay engaged. It's always pushing with that extra force. Um, and then other spots where that comes up would be in something like a brake. So here someone put a, a bike disc brake. Uh, they put a pneumatic cylinder on it. Uh, this is a, a Versa Planetary gearbox stage where someone uh, put a pneumatic cylinder on it to ram in and prevent it from rotating more. And that's another application where you're using that extra force to hold something. Um, and you're kind of, if the set point is another inch further, you're ramming in and holding something extra there. Uh, a couple cylinder tips. So I mentioned mounting earlier, like what does it take to make your intake pivot there are so many off the shelf options. Um, like if you're ordering on McMaster, scroll down on the page from your pneumatic cylinder, scroll down and you'll see all these different mounting options. Like, a, you know, they have fun names like a clevis <laughs> or a knuckle. Uh, but what's important here is that 
these are all off the shelf items that already exist. <laughs> if you try making different custom ones, it might be cheaper, but you know, if, if you're making your clevis in-house, uh-oh, someone drilled it crooked and it's tapped wrong and now you've got this weird side load going on. As soon as you start putting side loads on pneumatic cylinders, you risk just destroying and ruining everything. Um, by, by bending the rod, you can start to mess up the seal. By me when you mess up the seal, it'll start to leak. Um, Really, when you're designing to use pneumatic cylinders, you should only be pushing between two points directly. You have its mounting point and you have what it's pushing, and you should only have a force through the pneumatic cylinder in the direct line between those things. So you're just extending, you're pushing those two points apart. If you have your pneumatic cylinder mounted and it's bending, if there's any kind of that bending side load on it, you're going to start to destroy it. And maybe that'll work for this match, but in the next match, it might jam up and get destroyed. So please don't sideload um, and make your life easier and just use off the shelf mounting options. Ernst, we only have about five minutes left. Do you wanna wrap up? There's a question yeah, or I'm, two. Yeah, I'm almost done. Right, um, so managing capacity, this is just generally, um, you need enough air to get through your match. The small compressor won't do a whole lot. Uh, so ahead of time, a good practice is to run a fake match plus. So. Uh, with all of your air tanks lined up, pulse through all of your pneumatic cylinders and make sure you have enough air on its own. Uh, you really can't count on the compressor refreshing much during the match. Um, and you should also be periodically checking your system for leaks. If you aren't holding pressure, you're not gonna have enough capacity to get through the match, right? So uh, pressurize the robot, watch your main gauge and make sure that it's holding pressure for enough time. Uh, troubleshooting leaks will inevitably happen. Um, Sometimes you'll be able to hear it. Sometimes it's obvious. Sometimes you'll be able to feel it. Sometimes it won't be. And in that case, you can come in, uh, like that picture on the bottom uh, right shows, you come in with soapy water and try to find bubbles. Um, be careful, don't dump it on your electrical system. You know, um, there are a couple, uh, the troubleshooting process can be tough to be good at, but uh, if you think about it from a systematic point of view, um, you can block off certain sections and try to isolate where a leak could be. So if you block off everything after your air tank, for example, you can check that you're holding pressure there. And then you know, follow that same process across the board. Make sure that this line is working correctly and this one and this one and this one. This, one's, this concept's a little harder to explain, but it's easier. It's more obvious in person, but it doesn't uh, always happen directly. Uh, a couple of common leak causes, uh, like I mentioned a lot, bad seals, bad Teflon taping, um, but also a tube that's not cut right. If you have a tube with a big diagonal cut, it won't seat correctly in its uh, connector. So it's really, really clutch to get one of these uh, square cutters so that you always, uh, shown on the top right, so that you always have a square cut. And then finally, get your free stuff. You have vouchers in the kit of parts, use them. Uh, please <laughs> get your free thing, it's money, it's there for you. Um, and then, cool, go to questions. Uh, it was just one. Um, there was a comment that NPT creates a compression to tighten the fitting to hold the pressure. And then the question is, what would you recommend as the best way to prevent tubing from coming out of these connections? Um, yeah, so like I kind of just mentioned, um, I'll go back a couple slides. Uh, so using one of these tube cutters is a really good start. Uh, if you see anyone <clears throat> cutting a tube with like side cutters or scissors or something, yell at them and prevent that uh, because they'll mess it up. Um, if you cut with something else, you, you could crimp and kind of, instead of having a round tube, now you have a weird oval thing uh, that won't seat correctly. And instead of the end being a square cut, you can have this weird goofy diagonal cut that prevents it from seating correctly in its connector. Um, so I would say make the rule on your team that tubing can only be cut with one of these cutters. Um, what's also important when you're sticking a tube into the connector, you stick it in and then you give it a little pull. Um, I'll spam way back a bunch of slides. Uh, there we go. So these little, um, these press-in connectors, um, uh-oh, it's about to kick us out. This final thing, these press-in connectors, you have to push it in and then pull a little bit to set. That also makes sure that it's in there correctly. Um, breakout room's about to close. Thank you everybody for your time. Uh, hopefully this was helpful for you. Uh, if you have questions, our team email address is team at team1732.com. 
Uh, we also have a website with, uh, you can check the resources page here uh, to get a copy of this presentation.